Perhaps we all need to have one place that is, in our imaginations at least, a bit mysterious, a bit different. Since boyhood, that for me has been China. Even today in the People's Republic, with the symbol of the pylon replacing the pagoda, there's been nothing predictable about the progress of its revolution. Its radical shifts of policy have often perplexed both friend and critic alike. And sport and physical culture, which are my particular interests, are no exception to this. Last year, when I had the chance to travel to China, I was absolutely full of curiosity. Is it true, for example, that they believe in friendship first and competition second? Is there a total absence of violence amongst their spectators? Are they really as courteous as everyone seems to suggest? I wanted to know these things because, quite simply, we've had so little chance to see China's athletes in action. Since 1949, when the Communists came to power, there's been this extraordinary situation of a country with a quarter of the world's population being excluded from the world's single most important sporting event, the Olympic Games. Now at last it seems this will change. As I started my journey in this ancient land of the dragon, there was every prospect that China, after many years of quiet persistence, was again about to return to the Olympic movement. China's return started a few years back with the launching of its policy of ping-pong diplomacy. But behind the carefully calculated negotiations, what has actually been happening to sport and physical culture in this country? Famous for so many things, but not traditionally for its athletic prowess. I set out to find the answer by first going to Wuhan. On the banks of the mighty Yangtze, it is a city they call the Chicago of China. Chairman Mao first swam the Yangtze, and he did it in all about 15 times. But the most important swim of his was on July 16th, 1966, when he was a comparatively old man, into his 70s. And it was a great call for unity of the people, and thousands followed his example. All the groups from the community joined in, and something like 10,000 swimmers crossed the Yangtze in this way. We've got more than 6,000 swimming today, and it really is an incredible festival. Interestingly enough, there's a lovely anecdote about Chairman Mao's last swim, because when it was reported that he swam more than 15 kilometers, his time was recorded, and Western journalists pointed out that he'd beaten the world record for 15 kilometers. What they didn't realize, of course, is that the Yangtze here is a very fast-flowing river, and he was swimming downriver. But even so, as a show of strength, it was really quite something. And this now, as a festival, is the like of which I've never seen before. In fact, Mao Zedong, as befits the man of action in traditional China, wrote a poem about it. Now I am crossing the Thousand Mile River, looking beyond to the open sky of Chu. What do I care if the wind blows and the waves beat? It is better than idly strolling in some courtyard. Inspiration by personal example was typical of Mao. Even if in later years he became overweight and smoked heavily, he'd always considered physical culture as an essential part of mobilizing the energy of the masses. Their 
series is oft quoted saying, promote physical culture and build up the health of the people. A saying that may lack a certain inspirational ring about it, perhaps it just doesn't translate too well. But since the revolution, it has been the great rallying cry for the development of mass sport in China, the seeding ground, out of which would grow, it was hoped, China's sporting excellence. <laughs> Sport for all is, of course, a modern concept. Until recently, it had always been confined to the few who had sufficient leisure. In China, it consisted mainly of hunting and polo and archery. In a predominantly peasant society, most people were far too busy coping with flood, famine and the emperor's tax collectors. Nor was Confucianism or the Buddhist or Taoist religions that followed much concerned with competitive athleticism and the cult of the body beautiful that we in the West associate with the ancient Greeks. Man was on earth to live in harmony with his environment, not to be its proud master. And the idea of mens sana in corpore sana, as conceived by the redneck barbarian, was seen as but a crude interpretation of that subtle harmonizing of mind and body within the totality of the universe. I was made aware of this with Tai Chi Chuan, Chinese shadow boxing. And you can see it anywhere there's a Chinese community. That is, if you're prepared to get up early enough. In fact, there is little choice. By 6 a.m. here in Shanghai, the noise of bicycles, taxi horns, and the pipe music for the Tai Chi exercises gives the impression that the whole city has taken to the streets. <laughs> tai Chi has been described as meditation in movement. It is supposed to have been developed by a Taoist monk in the 12th century. It was also apparently the reason a certain elderly emperor was able to enjoy 1,200 concubines without exhaustion, or so the story goes. No doubt, like yoga, it has suffered the excessive claims of some of its devotees, which was why I was delighted in Peking to discover Mr. Sung. This moment is called Grab the bird's tail. Grab the bird's tail. Uh, yeah. Or grab the sparrow's tail. <laughs> it's an interesting name, isn't it? <laughs> That's right. Now comes the single whip. The single whip. 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 Yeah. And this is uh, called the snake creeps down. Snake creeps yeah. down. Golden cock standing on one leg. See? <laughs> Balance looks very important. Balance. Very important. You shouldn't show any trace of losing balance. Mr. Sung is a librarian at the Peking National Library. This one is called the white crane spreads its wings. The white crane. crane Born in Shanghai, he has never traveled out of China. This is a more forceful movement. Only occasionally do we see that it's related to boxing or to combat. Uh, well, it's hidden inside, <laughs> covered, you see. Yes. We met by chance when I came across him and his teacher, Mr. Lee, here giving the demonstration, practicing in a public park. Under the park. Uh, hidden under the park, you see. Yeah. And all the time, he concentrates on the quality of the movement. Quality of the movement. This bending of the legs all the time. It looks very demanding on the legs. Yes, yes. And without this, it won't give you a workout, a real workout. See. 
Although Mr. Lee worked with such consummate ease, I had the suspicion that it was all just a bit more strenuous than it looked. Just how much so, I was soon to discover. Now, uh, suppose we stand this way. Uh, yes. And, uh, and the idea of this? I'm going to circle to the point that I'm going to push you, see? Try to find out whether you have lost your balance, you see? If you do, then I'll try to push you over. <laughs> It's a very yeah. deceptive <laughs> form of exercise, <laughs> in that it looks, it looks relaxing. It looks simple. Yes, but it's, uh, yeah. it's also very demanding. Yeah. Turn your palm, turn your wrist. And Something that intrigued me, listening to Mr. Sung, was a criticism I'd heard by certain Tai Chi experts outside China. In their opinion, Tai Chi in the People's Republic had degenerated into merely a form of keep fit exercises, with the meditative aspect neglected. And it's possible there's some truth in this. Certainly in China today, simple Western calisthenics are as much in evidence as the subtleties of Tai Chi. In 1965, the Communist Press published an article entitled Eliminate the Dregs from Shadow Boxing, which was not, as one might think, an attack on bent fight promoters, but a criticism of what the authorities described as Tai Chi's many feudal superstitions. But the authorities' condemnation of the more metaphysical aspect of shadow boxing also had a more historical reason. Looking across from Shanghai's waterfront, it is easy to be carried into the past. Behind the solemn, squared-off facade of the people's architecture, there is still that comfortable backwater, which is Shanghai's old French Quarter. It's a reminder that this was once the most foreign of Chinese cities headquarters of those powers whose commercial activities had once reduced China to the condition of a colony. Britain particularly, who forced the sale of opium on an unwilling government and helped to humble a whole nation. Resentment against the arrogant foreigner, which often erupted in open rebellion, was one of the reasons for the formation at the end of the last century of the Society of Righteous and Harmonious Fists. Nicknamed boxers, they were one of China's many secret societies. Secret societies came about because, in spite of the gentle philosophies of Buddhism and Taoism, life traditionally for most people in China was anything but gentle. This is Wushu, the generic name for Chinese martial arts. They say it had its origins in the 17th century monastery of Shaolin, home of a band of Buddhist fighting monks. Having to travel the bandit-infested highways without weapons, they evolved their own system of unarmed combat. Today, Chinese Wushu, unlike Japanese Judo or Korean Taekwondo, is non-competitive. Instead, for professional troops like this, it's an extremely athletic and skillful ballet, expertly choreographed. Interestingly, the Kung Fu that we know from Hong Kong movies is dismissed in the People's Republic as a degenerate form of Wushu, but it's easy to see the connection.
wushu, of which Tai Chi was a part, and the leisure pursuits of the rich, that was the limit of physical culture in China. That is, until the arrival of the Christian missionaries. Rice Market Street, Peking. This old red brick building across the road was once Peking's YMCA. The missionary impact on China came at a time when at home the accent was on healthy minds in healthy bodies, what later came to be called muscular Christianity. It was also at a time when many Chinese had lost confidence in their ability of their traditional teachings to bring about change. To get the foreign devil off their backs, they would need to adopt some of his ways. In 1912, when the Republic was established, the leader of the nationalist movement, Dr. Sun Yat-sen, called for a self-strengthening program and a sense of national pride. Physical education was seen as an essential part of this, and it developed in two ways. First, under the Kuomintang army, physical education based on military disciplines and influenced by German and Japanese ideas. Secondly, through the missionaries, mainly the YMCA, the introduction of organized competitive sport, basketball, volleyball, boxing and athletics. Today in the People's Republic, you can see a mixture of all these inherited influences. But what the present authorities will tell you is that what their nationalist predecessors may have tried to do, they, the communists, have succeeded in doing. Physical culture on a massive scale. Whether that applies to the whole of China, I don't know. But it's certainly the impression you get in Peking. Now here is a nation who all seem to go to work on bicycles. And when they get there, they've got a pretty tough day ahead of them. And yet, at 5.30 in the morning, it's not just Tai Chi and Western style keep fit exercises that you see, but people playing basketball, volleyball, and badminton. No net, just across an open space. <laughs> and then there's the joggers, weaving their way through the crowds. It's really quite extraordinary. Now we've got our own Run for Fun Brigade in Great Britain, although whoever dubbed it Run for Fun was never middle-aged and overweight like me. Not only is it painful, but I find it personally embarrassing, especially when the neighbours are running alongside. Here, there is no embarrassment about exercise. Any age, any shape, everyone is taking part. But this is in the cities. What about the countryside? After all, over 80% of China's people still live on the land, which is a pretty phenomenal percentage if you compare it with, say, Britain's 2%. Contrary to Marxist orthodoxy, this was where the revolution found its power base. Here in the hills of Yan'an, after the sufferings of the Long March, Mao became convinced that the morale of the People's Liberation Army was also dependent on their physical condition. To adopt an expression Mao often used, it was a question of walking on two legs. Being politically motivated was not enough. This is a local sports meeting in a commune in Huxian County, a model commune with the population of a medium-sized town. Most of its people get up at the crack of dawn to work in the fields, usually doing a seven-day week. What surprised me was they still found time and energy for various sports activities. But they did, and it does give some indication of how, in the countryside at least, living conditions have improved. It was Mao who said, women hold up half the sky, and one thing that must impress is their changed role in society. Mao 
Mind you, any visitor to China soon becomes aware that nothing in one's itinerary happens by chance, that everything is carefully stage managed. At the same time, rubbing shoulders with ordinary people allows one to form one's own impressions too. And it was here, at this modest commune sports meeting, that I first saw what I'd heard others talk about so enthusiastically. The Chinese reputation for good sportsmanship, good humour, and above all, good manners on the field. Not that one should suppose it was all sweetness and light. In China, as in other communist countries, an essential part of any physical culture program is military training, the learning of skills for the defense of the motherland. At a middle school in Shanghai, named Huang Qingkuang, after one of China's Korean war heroes, I had the chance to see and talk with both pupils and staff. Here, as everywhere else, there was the obligatory reference to the Gang of Four, which perhaps I should explain at this point is the current political shorthand for referring to that now disgraced quartet led by Chiang Ching, Chairman Mao's third wife. They were, as the official expression goes, apparently radical leftists, but in reality, ultra-rightists, intent on sabotaging the revolution. Since even in a middle school like this, it is current party policy to attribute to them most of China's recent ills, I was tempted, like many visitors, to ask what they meant. How, for example, were they, as students and teachers, sabotaged? Four. And the answer that generally came back was this, that under their influence, any sort of excellence was condemned as elitism. Also, that teachers were totally denied their authority, and consequently, standards fell off dramatically. Now, according to their sports teacher, they were determined to redress the balance. No longer would political dogma be allowed to interfere with the pursuit of physical excellence. In China, throwing the grenade is an official competitive sports event, like throwing the javelin. And when it came to the girls, and I hope Tessa Sanderson will forgive me saying this, they seem to have about as much enthusiasm and skill as the average English girl trying to throw the javelin. Part of these youngsters' military training is learning how to ride and maintain motorbikes. Fairly antique models may be, but in a still poor country like China, few of these young people would ever have the chance of owning a motorbike themselves, and certainly no chance at trying their hand at something like parachute jumping. Apart from defending the motherland, Chairman Mao's edict, promote physical culture and build up the health of the people, was also intended to help improve people's output at work. Which brings me to the remarkable Mr. Sun, manager of a large children's clothes store. Every morning, before the shop opens to the public, the workers at this store are encouraged by Mr. Sun, or was it the publicly displayed attendance roaster, I don't know, to do 10 minutes of exercise. Yeah. 
Forgive the cynicism, but can you imagine this happening every morning outside Marks and Spencers with the full approval of the trade unions? Mr. Sun, 55 years old, was once a shoeshine boy, became an assistant in a medical supply store and has been manager of this government clothes shop for seven years. Some time ago, there was criticism of the poor service in the shop. There was also a lot of absenteeism. So Mr. Sun, following, he explained, the precepts of Chairman Mao, went to the local authorities and asked their help. So they gave him a set of simple exercises, especially devised for people working in shops, as Mr. Sun explains. <laughs> Surrounded by the store's proud display of good service certificates, we were given the chance to hear what the staff themselves thought about these exercises. Whether it was a question of what the boss and the party expects, or simply what they thought the foreigner should hear, I don't know. But it was easy to be impressed by the enthusiasm and good humour with which everyone talked about these exercises. This textile factory has produced profits 20% higher than its competitors and because of this has been named a Da Qing factory, a pace setter. As with Mr. Sun's stores, the exercises are specially devised. For instance, they can be done quickly and above all, they don't need any equipment, an important consideration in a facility-starved country like China. They're also good, one lady told me, for keeping you awake on night shift. Of course, such a practice is not confined to China or to communist countries. They do the same sort of thing in Japan. And if you think it all looks a little too regimented, let me tell you what one worker who spoke a little English told me. The 100% turnout for exercises was strictly for visiting film crews. The party's policy of promoting physical culture and building up the health of the people begins at nursery school. I was so struck with this sweet-sounding nursery rhyme that I asked if they would translate it for me. And this is what they said. We've picked a basket of big red apples. These apples are our hearts. We love you, wise leader Chairman Hua, and present these, our best apples, to you. For those of us raised on our nursery rhymes, perhaps it's all a bit too much too soon.
But simple politics and simple chair exercises, they both begin at three and a half years old. about six and a half years, they move on to infant school. It's at this age that they make the transition from informal play to structured sport. But happily, the accent is still on it being a lot of fun. Watching these children play ping pong on specially cut down tables, I thought it was splendid and just as it should be. But where do they nurture their talent? That extraordinary talent that has made China today the world's greatest players of table tennis. This I was to discover in China's spare time sports schools. As in most communist countries, normal school begins at 8 a.m. and finishes at 2, when the school's facilities are then made available for specialist training. China's spare time sports schools are where the real coaching begins. And make no mistake, here it is a serious business. Have a look at this. When the little girl fails to return the ball, it's down on the floor for press-ups. Every inch of this vast hall is specifically equipped for table tennis. No such hall exists in Britain. And in China, there are 100 million table tennis players. In Britain, enthusiastic sports teachers may become aware of talent and recommend children to join sports clubs. But the development of that talent is largely a post-school affair. Not so in China. Mrs. Kang Su Hua is a teacher at a special spare time sports school in Peking. It's special because it culls the best pupils from Peking's other 18 spare time sports schools. It is, in fact, a school for the creme de la creme. She's been there since 1960 and lives with her husband and two children in quarters that house 30 other sports school teachers and their families. She told me she once had the ambition to be a doctor but is now happy working as a gymnastics coach. Her other great interest is dancing, classical, Chinese, and friendship dancing, the last being China's expression for ballroom dancing, banned in the People's Republic since the Cultural Revolution and only now being tentatively reintroduced. I asked Mrs. Kung what criteria they use for selecting children as young as six for intensive training like this. It was a question, she said, of their potential. For instance, having relatively small physiques with a high power to weight ratio. And there's no doubt if you catch them at this age, when they have no fear, their development can be quite extraordinary, as proved in Russia and Romania. China was not slow to realize that women's gymnastics today is dominated by an altogether younger age group.
and it's easy to see what attracts young girls to this sport. Few forms of human expression can combine such grace and elegance with the extra dimension of courage. Look how this nine-year-old already seems to know by instinct how to express herself aesthetically with her body. One becomes particularly conscious of female gracefulness in the People's Republic because it's been so successfully hidden in that baggy blue denim that women are supposed to wear, which is why discovering the Peking girls' baseball team was something of a revelation. I must say, I didn't expect to find baseball, or to be more exact, softball, in China. And certainly not to find a girls' team playing a men's team and rather convincingly beating them. Their obvious sense of style and fun reminded me of the origin of the word sport, which is dispor, to be carried out of oneself, to get away from one's normal humdrum life. It seems much has changed since the Cultural Revolution and the Puritan strictures of the Gang of Four. It's easy to get the impression nowadays that every inadequacy to be found in China is directly attributable to the sabotage of the Gang of Four. But there was a period when not only were sports stadia turned over to pig farming, but this, China's main sports newspaper, was closed and its editor, along with his entire staff, were ordered to stop work for the revolution. I asked what this rather startling concept meant. Those of us who weren't sent to the communes were expected to study politics, carry out criticism, and paint big propaganda posters, they said. Now the newspaper is back in business, and although it would be naive to think that it would be reflecting anything other than the present official line on sport, there is no doubt that optimism about the future is as deeply felt as anger about the recent past. One thing that didn't help to improve standards was closing down China's main institute of physical culture, the equivalent in China to our Loughborough or Carnegie College. It is now reopened, but still bears evidence of its neglect. Look closely at the walls of this rather fine swimming pool, and you can see where the paint and plaster have peeled away. One coach told me that during the Gang of Four period, they were allowed to swim, but not to use stopwatches, because this smacked of competition and championshipism. Not easy to improve performance when you can't time yourself. The Sports Institute also has a department where China's traditional herbal remedies are being reassessed and applied to sports medicine. The subject of one's bodily functions is as popular a topic of conversation in China as the weather is in Britain. And a familiar sight in any town is this shop assistant measuring out a portion of ginseng root. That picked me up, much esteemed by old gentlemen of declining powers. With the application of herbal medicine and massage, the revolution, instead of discarding the past, is going back to it. Chairman Mao, whose father was a keen herbalist, was always concerned to establish a scientific basis for traditional medicine. Coming like most revolutionary leaders from a comfortable middle-class background, it was the long march that brought home to him how much the ordinary peasant depended on the old, well-tried methods. Not that he could have afforded anything else and how those methods could often be so effective. Whether it was simply a question of a bit of firm-footed manipulation or treatment by acupuncture. The application of traditional medicine in the context of sport 
doesn't mean that the Institute has turned its back on Western methods. On the contrary, new knowledge and techniques in sports medicine, developed in East and West Germany, Russia, America, Japan and Sweden, have been studied and applied here at the Institute, along with China's own modern refinements in acupuncture. Others, it seems, still prefer the old methods. Here, in another part of the sports medical center, acupuncture needles inserted near the kneecap are heated by a traditional slow-burning herb. So far in my travels, I had seen how, in this vast, largely rural and still poor country, they had applied the principle of sport for all. They had done it mostly with humble facilities and in their own particular way. I'd also seen from this base how in a limited number of sports they had identified and nurtured those who showed particular talent. But just how good was that talent? And did it come up to international standards? Shanghai's national stadium, I was to see China's best gymnasts compete against 11 other countries that included Romania, Canada and Japan. <laughs> Curtain raiser to the forthcoming Asian Games, it was as good an indicator as any of China's Olympic potential. Behind the international team of judges, China's now famous motto, friendship first, competition second. A sentiment that we'd seen carried to crippling extremes during the Cultural Revolution. Now, having been here a few weeks, I was reminded of that American sports official who teasingly said to his Chinese opposite number, remember, friendship first, competition second, Quite so, the Chinese official replied, but he added, we've already achieved the friendship first. In international gymnastics, the men's team event has been dominated by the Japanese since 1960. Here in Shanghai, for the very first time, they were to be beaten by the Chinese, which was quite astonishing. Women's gymnastics has been traditionally dominated by the all-round strength of the Russians, plus brilliant individuals like Nadia Comaneci of Romania. But again, here in Shanghai, against very strong opposition, which included the Romanians, it was the Chinese who won both the individual and team honours. And it's my guess that quite a few international gymnasts and judges must have had their eyes open by Peking's Lu Yacheng and Shanghai's Chu Chen. Mind you, Romania had lost Nadia Comaneci, who was recovering from an injury. And I wondered what she must have been thinking as she watched the particularly assured and explosive Chu Chen go through her paces on the balance beam. Sixteen-year-old Chu Cheng was one of the three athletes I asked to meet and see in training. In the past year, her trainer has been Qian Kui, who, with two others, coaches the national team. A team who impressed me enormously with their modest and relaxed manner. No histrionics, no bad-tempered displays of sulking, and with a public who follows their progress with somewhat subdued interest, no fan fever either. These were qualities that I saw carried over into their coaching. <laughs> when Chu Chung was 10 years old, both the national gymnastics and diving teams had their eye on her. 
In fact, she started off as a diver, but she preferred gymnastics, and so did her family. Here, Chu Cheng is in training for the Asian Games a few months ahead, an event that, until China returns to the Olympics, will be the most important event in which she can expect to compete. What interested me about this training session was the rapport that exists between coach and athlete. No Svengali-like attitudes. It's not simply a command and response situation, as one has seen with Olga Corbett and Knish, or Nadia Komenech under Bella Karoli. Chien is a very good motivator, but he gets his results quietly, in a very human way. The second athlete I asked to see was weightlifter Cheng Wei Chan, who a couple of years back broke the world youth record in the flyweight class. He comes from Canton in the south, near the Hong Kong border. This is the traditional home of the smaller weightlifters, the heavyweights coming mainly from northern China. Weightlifting runs in his family. His uncle, Chen Ching Kai, was the first Chinese weightlifter to break a world record. And another uncle was also of international class. I might mention here that in weightlifting, there is a particular British connection. It was the senior statesman of weightlifting, Oscar State, a Twickenham schoolmaster, who first succeeded in having China accepted into an international sports federation, which is, in effect, the first step on the ladder back to the Olympic movement. Chun's training routine, which includes a lot of running and football, was for some time badly neglected, according to his trainer. When I asked why, yet again I was told, because of the sabotage of the Gang of Four. Evidently, in his spare time sports school, the experienced coaches were replaced by party zealots, while the eager young weightlifters were sent to use their muscles more productively down on the commune. So the Chinese weightlifters are not quite a world force yet. Sadly, this drive to do away with the more competitive aspects of sport is not unknown in our own country. And it's come about, I think, because of a confusion in certain people's minds between wanting to compete and wanting to win at all costs. Two very different things. It's generally true to say that China, because of the upheavals of the Cultural Revolution and the Gang of Four period, really did lose a whole generation of athletes. And they're suffering from that now. Only recently, they have re-established the conditions for bringing on their best talent. Like, for instance, So Chen Xian, here in the blue tracksuit, triple jumper, from Dalian in northeast China. Now that cinder tracks have largely been replaced by polyurethane tracks, the event which has probably benefited most has been the triple jump. But So only has cinders to train on. It's quite remarkable that at 22, He's already achieved 16 meters 90, which puts him into world class. A student at the Institute of Physical Culture, he goes back to Dalian to see his family about twice a year. His father is a technical inspector in a crane factory. And since the payment of his living allowance is based on a means test, his family support him while he's living in Peking. Technically, it's very demanding, the triple jump. Watch So's style. Lovely, even rhythm. And then the jump itself. Three equal bounding stages which exemplify his great quality. The elastic strength of his legs. Having had the chance to meet some individual athletes, I went to see a team in training. In this instance, the women's national basketball team. Since 1971, this team has traveled to Japan, Malaysia, Iran, Chile, Spain, Mexico, the Dominican Republic, and the USA. 
dear, quiet, dear. It was generally agreed that they found America the most friendly country. And what they liked particularly there was the people's frankness. As many athletes came in for heavy criticism for attending so-called bourgeois-controlled sports events, at the time the basketball team was on its travels, I could only assume that some people had been less sabotaged by the Gang of Four than others, something I never quite managed to get into perspective. What was for sure was that these young women hadn't gone abroad just for the principle of friendship first. With the Asian Games in Bangkok a few months away, they gave me the distinct impression that they were going there not just to take part, but with every intention of winning. Bangkok, capital of Thailand, is 2,000 miles and a whole lifestyle away from Peking. This was the venue for the 1978 Asian Games. Now, I've been to many major championships, but this was my first Asian Games, a Games that, to their credit, the Thais organised magnificently after agreeing to host them at very short notice. Finance came mainly from the Arab countries, who, if they didn't do too well in the medal tally, apart from Iraq, they only got one bronze, made up for it in other ways. Soccer was the sport, but occasionally one saw the familiar British face. Jimmy Hill, Don Revie, of course, and here as coach manager to the Bahrain team, Jack Mansell. I must say, my first reaction was to wonder what the Chinese athletes would make of Bangkok. With Coca-Cola on tap in the hotel, fashionable pretty girls in tight jeans in the streets, not to mention all the other unrevolutionary diversions just a stone's throw away. It was something we foreign journalists never did find out. Bangkok for the Chinese team was to be, it seemed, a hotel, a stadium, and a long bus ride in between. Naturally, I took a particular interest in the athletes I'd had the good fortune to meet in China. Triple jumper Zhou Chenxian, since I'd seen him last, had set a new Asian record. But here at Bangkok, nursing a slight injury, he was not so lucky and had to be content with the silver medal. I missed the first two days of the games, by which time weightlifter Chung Wei Chang had achieved the best snatch to take the lead halfway through the competition but then completely missed out on the jerk and finished only in fifth place. Now he was taking it easy, seeing how his teammates were faring. Here, Yang Hui Ching, who eventually was to take a gold in the super heavyweight class. Most experts thought that the women's basketball final produced two of the best teams in the world, China and South Korea. For obvious reasons, there isn't too much love lost between these two countries. And when I'd anticipated in Peking that these girls would play a hard game, I wasn't wrong. In fact, just occasionally, friendship first looked dangerously like becoming yesterday's good resolution. South Korea won that one, so it was left to the Chinese men to salvage their pride in the men's final. Both these teams have improved dramatically in the last year or so, and would certainly reach the final stages of any Olympic tournament. One of the heroes of the Games was China's gentle giant, Mu Chie Chu, at 7 feet 6, the tallest basketball player in the world. The Thai crowd loved him, 
and when he got poked in the eye, whether by accident or on purpose, no one quite knew, the crowd went wild and there was a near riot. Mr Moo himself, a soldier by profession, and quite the pleasantest of men, seemed to remain, so to speak, aloof from the whole thing. The spectators at these games, mainly Thai of course, were marvellously enthusiastic. This is the final of the women's volleyball, a fine game between China and Japan, again two world-class teams. As I was to see on many other occasions, the Chinese seemed to be tremendously popular with the crowd. Now this could have many reasons, but I suspect that it may be partly because of the way that their athletes compete. There's no question of their not playing to win, not these days at least, but they play with a dignity and a courtesy that is refreshing to see. In this game, China was defeated by recent Olympic champions, Japan. In badminton, China reached all the finals to face the world champions, Indonesia. These are clearly the best two teams in the world. For China, it was the women's turn to take the gold in the team event, while the men won the silver. In table tennis, China won every available gold medal, individual and team. Here in the final of the doubles, they play Japan. And then there was their young gymnast, Chu Cheng, who won a gold and the hearts of the crowd in the event that she'd made her own. At the end of the games, the People's Republic finished a close second in the medal table to those traditional winners, Japan, followed by South Korea, North Korea, and in fifth place, host country, Thailand. It had been, for China, an excellent Games. Of course, there'd been some disappointments, but also some outstanding successes. Their gymnasts and their divers, for instance, had achieved standards to equal any in the world. China's other success was to follow a few months later at Montevideo. On April the 7th, 1979, the International Olympic Committee voted for China's return to the Olympic movement. It was a decision that, although too late to get them to Moscow next year, does mean that we can expect to see the Republic of China in the 1984 Olympics in Los Angeles. In my brief visit to China, it was clearly only possible to scratch the surface of sport in this vast country. But one naturally speculates on what sort of contribution China would make to the Olympic movement. In spite of the fact she carries a quarter of the world's people, it will be some time before they gather up handfuls of gold medals. But then I don't think that will be her main objective. China still holds to the principle of friendship first, competition second. And what they can bring to the Olympic movement are those twin virtues of fair play and good sportsmanship. And that can be no bad thing.